All right, uh, well, Falcher Ovalig, I guess, uh, Gia Dave. Uh, I'm a stranger here, so I'm at the hospitality of the local community. I must say it's the first time I've been here, and uh, I'd like to say congratulations, first of all. It's a wonderful resource and facility that you have here in Cardiff. I'm well aware of your exploits on the Gaelic field, um, but I've never had the opportunity to visit your, your village, so thanks ever so much for, for hosting Phoebe today. Uh, this is not my gig. I'm covering the Caledon part of the day. So Eddie is going to be your T or your MC here today. But the, the running order of this event will be, I am going to ask Bernie, the local representative, to come up and to speak to you and welcome you. Uh, then Eddie will give you some context as to why we're here in Cardiff today. Uh, following that, we have representatives from Batea in Catalonia. Uh, we have the cultural minister of Batea, and we also have a historian who is working on uh, unearthing and recovering historical remains uh, from the battles around the Ebro and the retreats uh, in which John Finnegan from this parish took part. Uh, th that work is ongoing, the recovery of historical remains, and perhaps one day we will find the remains of John Finnegan who left here all those years ago and we'd be delighted, and I hope to live and see the day when we can bring him back here to Cardiff as a proud son of the parish. Uh, right, we're running a little bit behind time, so I'm going to get proceedings underway. Can I also, at this stage, introduce, please, um, our musicians for the day? Tiernan O'Dinkin is an internationally acclaimed Ellen Piper. Any of you who know anything about traditional music will know who Tiernan O'Dinkin is. I've known him for quite some time through his connections with the Armagh Pipers Club and a, a, fantastic, a fantastic campaigner for both, not only the culture and the music, but also uh, and Gaelic Kamai, a good campaigner for the Irish language and culture. An all-round decent Gael. And uh, his companion, Luke, uh, from Montpellier, is uh, providing accompaniment for Tiernan today, and I'm really looking forward. Uh, they're going to play us three pieces of music. One of the pieces of music will accompany a film that Aitor has produced from, um, from Catalonia. And we, the soundtrack, we're having some difficulties, and the musicians have very kindly agreed to do what they used to do in the old days, when early cinema, when you had an orchestra pit down below the screen, and they're going to accompany the, the moving images. All right. Bernie, uh, Bernie also informs me that there will be a rousing piece of music uh, with which we will culminate this morning's events. Uh, we have a local piper also whose name? Jerry. Jerry. Jerry, we're looking forward to hearing from you. If you wouldn't mind piping us out, please, at the end to mark this very historic occasion. And it is a very, very significant and historic occasion here today. Bernie. Could you tell, come up and tell us who you are and what Cordoff's all about? Okay, I have to write my notes down because I have a head like a sieve. Um, Benvi Gouda, probably pronouncing that wrong, and Falcha, and welcome um, to everybody here. On behalf of Cordoff Refera Heritage Group, I would like to welcome the friends of the International Brigade here to Cordoff Refera Community Centre today and particular welcome to the people who have travelled all the way from Catalonia. About six weeks ago, I got a phone call from Brendan McConnell in Ballatrain, who had two gentlemen in his pub. And they were looking to make contact with somebody in the area uh, who was involved in history or the heritage of the area. And little did I know when I answered the call that day that six weeks later, we would have a busload of people coming here to commemorate a gentleman from the area and a gentleman that we ourselves actually didn't know about. As a heritage group, we're interested in the social history of the area, so it's been fascinating and yet sad um, uh, to know that one of our own ended up on the battle, dying on the battlefield in Catalonia. But it's probably understanding uh, how John Finnegan slipped through uh, our attention until now. John was born in 1909, and per the 1911 census, there were seven families living in Lissaquillan Lane, 
with 34 people in, in those seven families. Today, Tommy Finnegan has the lane all to himself. John, um, we know, went to Shrinti School per the roll book, and he started in, at the school in April of 1913. Uh, when John's only sister, Mary Ann, died in 1944, her death was recorded in the Northern Standard newspaper. And the report said that one of her brothers, John Finnegan, uh, is in America. John uh, was actually dead six years at that stage. So the family didn't even know about his whereabouts and they didn't, didn't know that he was dead. So back to that phone call with Garode um, six weeks ago uh, when he mentioned John Finnegan and knew nothing about John Finnegan. So the first job was to figure out who uh, John Finnegan was because there was three uh, Finnegan families on Lissaquin and Lane. So I'd like to thank Tommy and his brother James for helping us to sort out um, that John actually belonged to a family known as the Pike Finnegans. Um, I also want to thank Joe Callan and Jared and Oliver uh, Riley over the last couple of weeks have helped me pull information together about the family. So I really appreciate that, Joe, Jared, and Oliver. And um, I particularly want to thank Tommy because I've been rambling on his land for the last couple of weeks taking photographs and I do appreciate um, getting access to take photos because it's nice to keep a record of these buildings and uh, gather as much information as we can about the families. So now I'm going to hand you over to Eddie uh, for the next part. This event came about as probably it, 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 the idea of an event for the Charlie Donnelly Winter School linking um, Pedro Down into this 100th anniversary of the Soviets in Caledon and Monaghan. And that was our theme, that would have been our theme for our Charlie Donnelly Winter School this year, or by annual winter school. However, last year, just before, about six weeks before, we had got, planned to go out to the Ebro. Uh, after years of somewhat fruitless searching, we found a, a, a register with uh, people who immigrated into Canada, and it was in through Ottawa, and we found a John Finnegan sailing from Belfast, arriving there, and he had come in under the immigration scheme, and. That was a scheme that was introduced by Canada to bring in workers to the Vancouver and the Ottawa areas where there was very few workers. Most of them could have come in from Scandinavia. Forestry workers and um, John Finnegan was among that group. Um, there's a bit of a gap in our terms of our knowledge of him between 1931 and 33, but we do know that him and quite a few others were on the famous Ottawa march, and that was during the recession of um, 1929 and 1936, when the, those workers who were in camps, and basically they were very poorly paid, it was, it was glorified soup kitchens, you work and you get fed and you get pittance money. They went on strike and said that was enough, you couldn't, they couldn't survive. And those workers and miners gathered from various parts of the area in Western Canada decided they were going to march on Ottawa and had the famous walk, that famous walk. Some of them walked, some of them hitched lift, but most of them rode on the top of trains. Um, like you hear Woody Guthrie talk about those guys bumming it on the train. So they moved through it and it was creating a huge, huge problem for the, the government, the Conservative government that was in that area, that, in power at that time. And they halted them in an area called Regina. They halted them with gunfire, and that's, that's a simple aspect of it. Arrested all the leaders, starved them out of the area, and drove them back. It toppled that government, and it brought in a much more progressive uh, Mackenzie government at the time. Now, John Finnegan certainly was involved in that. Um, there's no question about that, because many of those peoples and those leaders of that there later on become heavily involved in the reformation of the trade union movements, right? And then decided that they had to go and fight uh, um, fascism in Spain. Uh, John Finnegan came in, on the, in into, into Spain on the 5th of um, in the f May on 1937. His first action was if he fought along the Mac Pops, not, uh, not the British Battalion or the Lincolns. He fought with the Mac Mackenzie Papua New Battalion, and he. Um, was very, very quickly into action at Brunetti. Um, this was a big attack on the west of, of, of Madrid uh, in the scorching hot sun, um, temperatures running at 40, 43 degrees. 
and they wanted to drive, they wanted to cut off the, the fascists from the northern area. And there was a diversionary attack too, because the Basque country and Galicia and, and, and the areas around Santander were falling quite quickly. And um, into that, Mackenzie Pabinier suffered heavily in that, as, as well did the Lincolns, and quite a few Aries from the British battalions was also killed in that as well. From that period of time, they were in various battles. They'd been up in Terrawell, and then they moved up with, along with most of them to form a, a front line just to the west of um, Bell City. And here is where we see the tactics, the great tactics, or the great evolutionary tactics that the, the Germans, the fascists used in the Second World War, the first full-blown Blitzkrieg, which was utilized in, in um, Poland not very long afterwards and toppled it very quickly. They moved some of the Franco's men, moved some 150,000 men into the area. They had the Condor Legion, Mercer Smith's the 88 millimeter guns, which destroyed everything in the Second World War. They moved that in. And within days, they had just swept the line for 150 kilometers. They just pushed them back. And that came back into the area of the Great Retreats. It's called the Great Retreats. And they were just, uh, uh, the armies were in, uh, just fleeing in many respects. However, the British Battalion, the Macpops, and the Lincolns, classified as shock troops in many ways, were holding the door. They were just holding the rear guard. Um, and John Finnegan was among that group, along with another man whose roots are lying in Monaghan from Emmy Vale, but is, was residing in Achnaclai, Ben Murray. Ben Murray was also killed in that at an early stage outside Pablo Lehikar. John Finnegan survived that um, back at Caspi, which is down close to the Eber River. They were trying to get across the Eber River and form a front line, a defensive line there, and stop. Franco's forces from breaking the Republic, and that was their plan, split it, get to the, um, the Mediterranean, and it would isolate Catalonia from the Valencia and the southern region of Spain. Again, the um, international brigades, along with the remnants of the Spanish army, formed a, a, a front, a, a last line of defense at Caspe, and slowly were pushed back. And I won't narrate what uh, Aether is going to talk about. This is where John Finnegan got killed, and Aether has better knowledge than I have, it, though I've been there many times. So John Finnegan is one of many um, brigaders, and particularly the Lincolns and um, the Mac Pops, because they were decimated, completely decimated in terms of they never knew where some of them went. Many of them were drowned in the river. The bridges were blown and the fascists swept down, strangely enough, with cavalry, which was one huge attack on the, on the Mac Pops, and they were cut to ribbons. Um, I think there was, um, on that particular step, I it will tell you back, I think there was 268 killed. The Lincolns were, uh, but the British battalion, on the day that um, John Finnegan was killed, the British battalion were moving up, led by Frank Ryan and others, um, Bob Doyle, and um, I think there might have been 560 of them. Now, there were some Spanish people reinforcing them at that stage, and they ran into which, uh, the famous um, Black Arrows armored column of the belonging to the Italians, and these were the Italians' elite troops. And they thought they had walked into friendly people, and they greeted them and all, and one guy walked up, and they opened fire on them. And they, I think there was, there was a left, there was only about 40 that scattered into the mountains. The rest were captured and 160 of them were killed. And that, in many respects, was the end of the, um, in a formal sense, of the British battalion, which many of the Irish were fighting with at that stage. The Mac Pops, as I say, reformed again, and both, all of them reformed and came back again at the Battle of the Ebro, but that's, that's another story. However, getting back to, that's, that's, the outline of, 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 of John Finnegan's time in, in, Spain, in Spain, but there's a much wider narrative than that, which we're still working on. It's, um, it's somewhat, um, it's, it's a kind of a motive to find that, you, you know, somebody who's been missing, gone from history, uh, and many, many more, who probably never will be found, and the details will never be recorded of just where they died. We're lucky in a sense that we do have Aether here, which we linked up with um, a year ago. And he took us, um, Aether's a very young historian, uh, full of energy and full of commitment and belief. He had run into, and still does have a problem in his own area from much more older um, conservative and accepted historians who think the young whippersnapper on the block, you know, is usurping us. So there were, 
they were denying that um, that that group of Mac Pops on the Lincolns had ever come near Batea. And um, thankfully and gratefully, Ater has proved them wrong. And his book launched last when, uh, last Saturday night proves that. So I don't know what those historians are going to feel like now, fools, or, or, or will they, you know, hand this, the applause to him. He took us to the area where um, John Finnegan was killed. And there is a narrative and written documentation after a, an artillery attack. Two brigaders who were in the trench, and it's most certainly they were Mac Pops, uh, they were hit with an artillery round and um, to devastating effects, it, the bodies had caught fire and, and, and broken up quite a bit. But from the farmer, the bodies were left on the scene, they, they were pushed back, the Mac Pops were pushed back down towards the Ebro. But two farmers and his son working in the field looked uh, and saw the bodies lying and went over to them. And um, they found that uh, they were reading in English newspapers. So that makes them, they, they had to be the Mac Pops anyhow, you know, because the British battalion weren't there and the Lincolns were off to the other side. And one of them was smoking a pipe. Uh, the pipe was still lit, lying on the f beside, off to the side. He took us there, but later that day he took me to, um, and um, the, down to an area where the farmers took the bodies, they took five and three and put them in the tree in one, trend, in one tomb or hole and five in the other, and you can quite clearly, clearly see them. But walking across to see the bodies, on the, on the, in the vineyards that were there, the human bones everywhere, um, and the farmer that owns that has given f you know, free you know, run to the likes of Ader and the other people who are collecting those bones. He says, I am not political, I, I don't, but he says, I like to, get, to gather up the bones and put them in a little mound. He says, I, at the end of the day, he says, it doesn't matter what side they were fighting on. These were some mother and father's children. And it's good to bring back to this area the memory of uh, John Finnegan and the sacrifice that he made, you know, and, and, and return his memory um, to this area, because when we first came here and I, last year we had been into this area to try and find, it was late on, on, on Saturday evening in March, coming dark, and we had been with Brendan, uh, as um, Bernie mentioned, up in the, in the pub up in last year, and uh, three strange guys like asking questions, like it was a bit odd, I wouldn't have felt comfortable, uh, so thankfully he was somewhat skeptical, was because at least, uh, you know, there's somebody has got it keeping an eye out. But he did put us in, in touch, and uh, that evening we went down to the lane, down to where his house was, and we met Tommy. Tommy um, probably scared the life out of him. Three strangers driving down. It was even darker at this stage, but I, I, we quickly um, allayed his fears that we weren't, you know, predators, um, despite our looks. Um, and he, 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 he briefed us on it, and I, he was quite shocked to find that, you know, uh, disbelief that his neighbour and the man down the road and the house that he own, owns today, that somebody could go and be di disappear off the face of the earth uh, and not be talked about. And as most many people from this area would, would say, well, why, why was he not talked about? Why, why is his name erased from history? You'll find that everywhere. Down the road here in Napa, I'm sure most of you locals know where Napa is, there's a Peter Hamill as well, again fighting with the Mac Pops. Nobody knows him. Up in Bally Bay, there's a Thomas Trainer. Over to uh, Inneskeen, there's two brothers, the Murphys. Just there, a lady came in tonight, there, she couldn't stay, and she gave me details of a man, she, her uncle, from Carrick Macross. Now, we have to research him, we don't know him, but she said that's the narrative in the family, he was there. Very little of this detail was, rec was recorded in, 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 in history. A couple of reasons. Coming back here, the first of the brigaders who went out from Ireland and returned right were blacklisted. They couldn't get no work, they were shunned by the community in many respects. And f the Catholic Church led the way in that because, I mean, these people were out fighting for, for the Republic <laughs> and uh, classified as Reds, despite the fact that it wasn't a communist government. So the, the latter group that was coming out in the, in the mid 37s. To give a, a lot of wrong information, to give dates of birth were wrong, to give where they came from was wrong. And John Finnegan himself was obviously quite aware of that from feedback, that you couldn't, you know, give correct details. 
Um, this area, and, and as opposed to a civil war, is I mean, it was it was it was divisions in this as well. You know, Duffy came from just up the way, so he didn't uh, when he gave his correct details, which went on the files, which wouldn't be known to you know the the ordinary person. He gave his address of his next of kin, and if he had to be informed, was C Peter Finnegan, which was his father, care of the post office in Castle Blaney. So he was quite aware that, I mean, it would maybe create a problem for his family, or there was, was left there, the fact that he was out in, 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 in Spain fighting for the, the Republic. Um, so you have, you have this problem, and then again, you have to f follow through all these details. But f slowly but surely, we are uncovering, and, and quickly too, we're getting quite adept at this with our own research, because we now do our own research, and we're getting good at it. But as I say, I would like to, I mean, I, 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 this community has embraced us. Like, we were strangers six weeks ago or eight weeks ago, we were strangers in the series, you know? Um, and, and they embraced the idea, they felt it was, uh, they, they feel, and, and somewhat they should do, because we are rewarded by their efforts, and, and we are rewarded by our finding of him. And again, thank you, Bernie, and thank you to all the community, and also to thank Eter and his group over from Catalonia. Yesterday, which is uh, just a, an aside issue, we, yesterday we were going to go across to the house and bring the Catalonian people down to the house and get it photographed and just show the plaque which is here, which is thankfully be going on the wall somewhere in this community centre. We were going to bring him down, but I was talking to Bernie mentioned that it might not have been, it was a good idea we didn't go because uh, Tommy was out uh, with the slurry tankers Splitting the slurry, but I, I thought that would have been a quite a good because w here we have um, our, our one of our members from uh, Catalonia. Um, he he has vineyards, you know, and he would have been quite interesting to see like how they fertilize the grass here as opposed to how he fertilizes the vineyards in Catalonia. But um, however, I, I I'll not delay and. Um, this is, as I say, this is part of a, uh, it's already knitted. We, the link again, of course, which I began at the start, I finished with now. Pedro Don, um, Pedro Don, Ernie O'Malley, and O'Duffy had something in common on the 14th of February, 1919. They were involved in the attack on Shantana, um, some call it Bally Train, um, barracks. It was the first. RIC barracks captured by the IRA in the War of Independence. Um, the links here is Pedro Down was there. Um, Pedro Down went on. He was working, been working for the ITW as well as working for the Irish Republican Army at that stage. He was involved in the um, the Soviets and um, the strikes in Monaghan Hospital and again in Caledon, where we were going to later today to do that part of our day's work. And again, Pedro Down was in Barcelona when the coup took place. Uh, was there three to four months um, uh, among the people there. Some say he was much more closely um, linked to some of the to the activities than he quite uh, than he claimed to, you know. So I wouldn't be surprised he was a bit hands-on at time, you know. Um, and as I say, he came back, wrote salute. It, we're giving Charlie Donnelly again, again. We're commemorating Charlie Donnelly. Charlie Donnelly, Pedro Down were the leading, uh, so, some of the leading figures within Republican Congress. The Republican, many, many of the Republican Congress members who went to Spain. Um, unfortunately, very few of them come back again. The best, and the best of them die. The leading ideologues of, 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 of left-wing political ideology in this country were lost in Spain. So the thread runs through the, the history and it comes round again and finishes up where it is. And today, at this moment, it's John Finnegan we're talking about. So, and I'll say no more. And I'll give you to Itter, who will give you the um, much more comprehensive uh, aspect of our, um, how he died and what was happening when he died. Thank you. Thank you, and I can't remember if I introduced Eddie properly. Eddie is president of the Friends of the International Brigades and was one of the founding members, along with Bob Doyle and Harry Owens and one or two other people. It started out as the Friends of Charlie Donnelly, but because of the interest from all around the country, it, it quickly grew into a 32-county organization and one which is doing invaluable work. Thanks, Eddie. 
Okay, as Eddie mentioned, we have uh, an interna two international visitors today. Um, they're from Catalonia, and as most of you have been following the news over the last couple of years, will know Catalonia has its own constitutional difficulties at the moment. It's locked in a struggle for independence uh, from the Spanish state, uh, which has come down quite hard and uh, repressively against campaigners for independence. So maybe um, could I extend our best wishes to those of you who are undergoing uh, the difficulties with the Spanish state at the minute and wish you all the best with your efforts. Um, right, Eddie has introduced um, Etor, Etor Garcia Sole, uh, to give him his full title, is a historian from Batea. Um, Eddie mentioned that he uh, was a very valuable asset to us when we were out covering the 80th anniversary of the Ebro last year and took us to all the places we needed to go to and introduced us to all the important people, one of whom is his colleagues, his colleague, sorry, uh, Xavier Galcera Adel, who is the Minister for Culture in Batea and who offered up his premises to us, uh, were very hospitable whenever we were over last year. I'll let you take the floor again. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, well, <laughs> although many of you already know me, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Aitor Garcia Sole, and I am from Batea, a little village in the southwest region of Catalonia, really close to Aragon. Since I was a child, I was fascinated by the history obtaining a degree in history at the Rovira i Virgili University in Tarragona. It has always fascinated me how those volunteers gave their lives for an ideal, the international solidarity and the struggle for the democratic values. To begin this conference, I would like to thank Phoebe and uh, Monaghan Town for the invitation to this event and to help us to come to Monaghan. I, uh, well, right now, uh, Javier, which is the, the culture counselor, uh, will give you our uh, words. Uh, he doesn't speak English. For this reason, I will translate him. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Javier Galcera Adell. Um, primer lloc, disculpeu que no pugui adreçar-me a vostès amb la seva llengua. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize because I can address you with your language. Jo pertany a una generació en què es considerava que el tercer idioma a aprendre era el francès. But I belong to a generation where it was considered that the third language has to be the French. Jo uh, sóc regidor de l'Ajuntament de Batea. Batea és un poble de Catalunya. Un poble encara avui pagès, un poble que viu del vi i per al vi. Som els primers productors de vi de Catalunya. De les nostres vinyes i els nostres cellers neix alguns dels millors vins d'Espanya. I'm a culture councillor in the Batea Stone Hall. Batea is a Catalonian village which is still dedicated to the agriculture. A village that lives from the wine and for the wine. We are the first wine producers in Catalonia. From our vineyards and winers, are born some of the best wines from Spain. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Batea també és un poble de frontera. Frontera entre dos terres que avui formen part d'un mateix estat, però no sempre ha estat així. Per aquesta raó, al llarg de la història, la meva terra, el meu poble, Batea, ha estat escenaris de diversos enfrontaments bèl·lics. Uh, Batea is also a border village a border between lands that today form part of the same state, but it hasn't always been that way. For this reason, throughout the history, my land, my village, Batea, has been the place of various armed conflicts. Uh, regidor de Ser regidor de l'Ajuntament de Batea és un fet puntual i amateur, amb l'únic interès d'intentar millorar la qualitat de vida dels bateans. Jo soc pagès, viticultor, em dedico a conrear la vinya, 
Being a councillor at Batea Town Hall is a transient and amateur event with the unique interest of trying to improve the quality of life of the Bateans, the villagers. I am a farmer, a winemaker. I devote to cultivating the vineyard. Tots els pagesos de Batea, conreant les vinyes, hem trobat restes d'explosius, d'armament, munició, material militar divers i inclús restes humanes. Sabem que en algunes de les nostres finques, sobretot les més properes al riu Algàs, que fa frontera entre Catalunya i l'Aragó, existeix una espectacular infraestructura militar defensiva. Restes d'una enginyeria militar que durant aquests 80 anys el bosc i l'erosió han anat mimetitzant i engullint dins el paisatge. All the farmers of Batea cultivating the vineyards have fought remind of explosives, weapons, munition, diverse military equipment and even human remains. They know that in some of our properties, especially those closest to the Algas River, which, border, which borders Catalonia and Aragon, there is a spectacular defense, defensive military infrastructure. The remains of military engineering which during these 80 years, the forest and the erosion has gone imitating and shallowing them inside of the landscape. Batea, Batea pertany a la comarca de la Terra Alta. I en aquesta comarca i les vines es va viure la batalla més important i cruenta de la Guerra Civil Espanyola que durant 115 dies va dessagnar els dos exèrcits i va devastar els nostres pobles. Una batalla on es va lluitar cos a cos, on es va lluitar per cada cota, on es va utilitzar l'armament més punter de l'època, que pocs anys després s'utilitzaria en la Segona Guerra Mundial. Una batalla on no tan sols van combatir espanyols contra espanyols, catalans contra catalans, sinó que jóvens de molts països del món van venir a lluitar i alguns a morir a la nostra terra. Batea belongs to the region of Terra Alta, and in this region and neighboring, they lived the most important and harsh battle of the Spanish Civil War that during 115 days drained the two, the two armies and devastating our villages. A battle where they fought hand to hand, where they, fought, where they have to fought for each hate, where it was used the most highest weaponry of the time that a few years later was used in the World War II. A battle where not only fought Spanish people against Spanish people, Catalans against Catalans, but young, but young people from many countries of the world came to fight and some of and some today in our land. La batalla de l'Ebre, donada la seva gran magnitud, importància i rellevància com a episodi bèl·lic i sociopolític dins l'Espanya i la Catalunya de l'època, ha estat estudiada, analitzada i divulgada per nombrosos historiadors i organismes com ara el Comebe, Consorci Memorial de la Batalla de l'Ebre, del qual en formo part. Aquesta gran rellevància i el silenci i la parcialitat a la que obligar el llarg període de la dictadura franquista ha fet que molts episodis bèl·lics i polítics hagin quedat ocultats i oblidats. The Battle of the Ebro, owning its great magnitude, importance and relevance as an armed conflict and sociopolitical episode inside the Spain and the Catalonia of the time, has been studied, analyzed and divulged by numerous historians and organizations such as Comebe, Memorial Consistorium of the Battle of the Ebro, which I take part. This great relevance, the silence and the partiality to which the long period of Franco's dictatorship has forced, has made other armed conflicts and political ep episodes have been hidden and forgotten. L'exèrcit republicà va perdre la batalla i amb ella l'única esperança de guanyar la guerra. Amb aquesta derrota, Espanya entra en una llarga nit de dictadura, repressió i silenci. The Republican Army lost the battle, and with it, the only hope to win the war. With this defeat, Spain enters in a long night of dictatorship, repression and silence. Però Batea, en tot aquest episodi bèl·lic, es queda a la redaguardia. Des dels primers dies de l'1 d'abril del 38, era territori de l'exèrcit sublevat. El poble Batea va ser on durant aquests 15 dies les tropes franquistes descansaven tenien els hospitals de campanya i on enterraven ordenadament els seus morts. But Batea, in all this armed conflict, was left in the, in the backward. 
from the first days of the April in the year 1938, Batea was territory of the rebels army. The village of Batea was where during this tragic 115 days, the troops of Franco rested. They had their fields hospitals and where they dead were buried. I si sabem que això va ser així, donen les restes de material bèl·lic que es troben en les rodalies del riu Algas? And if we know that this was the case, where does the rest of the war material come from Nervi River Algas? És aquí on entra l'Aitor. Este jove historiador, amb el seu estudi, està posant a la llum un episodi bèl·lic de gran importància i magnitud que per diferents raons no ha estat conegut ni estudiat. This is where Aitor take part. This young historian, with his study, is bringing to light a war episode of great importance and magnitude, which for various reasons has not been known or studied. La batalla de l'Algas va tenir una gran importància dins la guerra civil espanyola, especialment pel protagonisme que tingueren les brigades internacionals. El sacrifici i la oriositat dels prodigadistes van ajudar a fer una retirada més ordenada de l'exèrcit republicà. The Battle of the Algas, it was very important in the Spanish Civil War, especially because of the prominence of the international brigades. The sacrifice and heroic acts of the, of the brigadians helped to make a more ordered retreat from the Army of the Republic. In aquells dies de l'abril del 1938, els dos combats que tingueren lloc en la nostra terra foren tan acarnissats que les restes de molts d'aquests combatents probablement encara resten en el terreny on pergueren la vida. En aquests dies d'abril, en 1938, la lluita de l'hort que va tenir lloc en el nostre terreny va ser tan blodi que els remains de molts d'aquests lluitadors probablement encara remen en el lloc on van perdre les seves vides. Jovens europeus i nord-americans que vingueren a lluitar contra el feixisme i per defensar els seus liderats van trobar la mort en les nostres terres i els seus cossos, molts d'ells, donada la cruesa del combat, encara resten allí on van ser abatuts. Young Europeans and Americans who came to fight against fascism and to defend their ideals found the death in our lands and the bodies of many of them given the cruelness of the combat. They still remain in the place where they were killed. És aquesta una de les raons per la qual el Parlament de Catalunya, el 30 de juny del 2009, va aprovar la llei sobre la localització de persones desaparegudes durant la Guerra Civil i la dictadura franquista i la dignificació de les fosses comunes. This is one of the reasons why the Parlament of Catalunya, the 30th of June of 2009, approved the law about the location of people disappeared during the Civil War and the Franco dictatorship and dignified the common graves. El govern de Catalunya ha engegat un pla de fosses que té l'objectiu de contribuir a la recuperació de la memòria històrica amb l'obertura de les fosses i la recerca de les restes que hi ha a Catalunya per poder analitzar i retornar-les als seus familiars o bé donar-les una sepultura digna. The government of Catalonia has set up a graves plane that aims to contribute to the recovery of the historical memory with the opening of the common graves and the search for the remains in Catalonia to be able to analyze and return them to their relatives or give them a decent burial. The plan contemplates the identification genetic of the remains and for this purpose it has created a bank of DNA. Durant aquests anys s'han excavat 41 fosses i s'han recuperat 345 restes humanes. The plan contemplates the genetic identification of the remains and in order to can do it, a bank of ADN has been created. During these years, 41 graves have been excavated and 345 people have been recovered. Donada la rellevància de l'estudi de l'Aitor, la Direcció General de Memòria Històrica ha engegat el protocol d'actuació per la recerca de les restes de persones mortes en combat. Els treballs de recerca han donat resultats. S'han trobat restes de combatents en superfície que demostren la cruesa del combat i la veracitat dels estudis de l'Aitor. Given the importance of Aitor research, the General Directorate of Historical Memory has set up an action protocol for the search for remains of people killed in combat. The research work 
have given results. They have been found remains of, of fighters in surface, what demonstrates the cruelty of combat and the veracity of ITOR studies. Les institucions catalanes tenim per, end per endavant molta feina. Feina per aclarir aquesta etapa de la nostra història i per poder tancar les ferides que encara estan obertes a la nostra societat i donar el just reconeixement a tots aquests jóvens que un dia van deixar la seva terra, les seves famílies, el seu treball i els seus somnis per venir a lluitar i donar suport a una democràcia. Sapigueu que el seu esforç no va ser inútil, va ajudar a sembrar la llavor de la democràcia. The Catalan institutions, we have a lot of work ahead. Work to clarify this stage of our history and to close the wounds that are still open in our society and give just recognition to all those young people who once left their land, their families, their work and their dreams to come to fight in order to support a democracy. You should know that their effort was not us useless. Help to, help to sow the seed of democracy. Thank you. Uh, to promote this book, uh, we made a short clip uh, that we want to show you because we look for, for a history to, to make the, the, the video. We look for an experience of any fighter and we decided to reproduce the experience of John Finnegan in our land through this clip of video. Uh, Please, could we start with music?
Uh, well, today I wanted to explain the battle of the Algas River through the eyes of John Finnegan. Uh, but you could already hear that story uh, happened in Batea. Uh, that's why I bring you, uh, well, this map where you could see where is located Batea. We are just in, in the southwest, uh, close to, to Aragon. Uh, Maria? Uh, well, uh, as we know, John was a blacksmith, but one day he decided to replace the hammer with a rifle to help the Spanish proletarian. We know that on July 20, 21st, 1937, he arrived in, at Spain. Five days later, he joined to the international brigades in the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion. Only John could tell us everything he lived until March 18, 1938. That day, John arrived at a new place, a town called Batea. He stayed in a barrack for 10 days, in the middle of the vineyards and the almond trees. It was the, metal, the military camp of Batea. There, he improved his military knowledge. There, John met comrades from other countries, Germans, Austrians, Poles, French, Belgians, etc. Soon, the international brigades received new weapons and, and munitions. Due to the annexation of Austria by the, Nazi Germ by the Nazi Germany, France opened the borders for the entry of weapons. It is possible that John received a new rifle made in Russia because the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion received 550 of these rifles. He would also receive a lot of bullets and grenades. Shortly, he had realized that the front was closed. On March 27, a commission of mayors of Catalonia and Aragon met in Batea. Its objective was to help the Republican army to fortify in view of the approaching fascist attack. Many international volunteers worked on the fortification tasks. Perhaps John Finnegan had to dig trenches or foxholes. It was March 29. The officers ordered to march. John collected his belongings and went to the trenches. On the 30th, they began to fortify their new positions. Perhaps they saw some of the bombings that the fascists were starting to loud. As you see, there is uh, Batea, with, uh, with explosions. That same day, 30, the boys of the 14, 12, and 139 brigades fought strong battle against the fascists in the river Matarraña. John would see the combat from his new trenches in the Barranc dels Barcelonets, which is just in the, th in the south, when you could see Caseres and 60 Battalion, John was there. The next day, March 31st, the fascists launched a very strong attack. The 1st Division of Navarra in the north against the, the German boys. The 55th Division in the center against the, the Austrian and German boys and the Corpo Trope Voluntarie in the south. In this morning, John fought bravely against the Mussolini fascist, which couldn't pass. It was, a bodily, it was a bloody struggle. Many comrades of Finnegan were killed. For that reason, they were transferred to safer fortifications. Uh, they went to the fortifications that, that we have seen in, in this video. By the afternoon, they arrived at Sierra de la Bocha, where there are bunkers and shelters made with concrete. During the whole afternoon, the fascists tried to pass, but Finnegan and his comrades stood firm in their trenches, resisting attack after attack. That resistance infuriated the fascists. On the morning of the 1st of April, they launched a massive attack with Italian fascists Spanish phalangists 
and Moroccan mercenaries, which came from the unit called Meala. The fascists launched a large ice strikes and bombardments with artillery and mortars. Some bunkers, as you can see in the photo, were totally destroyed by the artillery. Fortunately, the boys of the Mackenzie Papineau were replaced before the slaughter. It was the boys from the Marcel Sagnier group who suffered the fascist attack. It's possible that John had retired to the Serra de Mudefes, where the battle continued a few wars later. The fascist attack became even more violent, including tank attacks. The Republicans retreated to an area with low mountains that we you could see in, in the lower photo. Uh, there, the Republican army tried to resist again, but there the fascists could infiltrate through the Republican positions. As a result of these fascist infiltrations, close quarter fighting took place. Many brave freedom fighters died that day. One of those brave was John Finnegan. The fascists made sure that the bodies were abandoned in the mountains. Only a few farmers buried the bodies. It was 80 years since John gave his life for a novel cause. With the visit of Phoebe, we showed John and his comrades that we haven't forgotten them. So they still alive in our memory. John was just a soldier, but for us, he is an example of the fight against the fascism and the defense of freedom and human rights. As I said, we haven't forgot, forget John Finnegan and his comrades. We want them to return to their land. It, if it's not possible, we want that their remains rest in a memorial space. It has been very difficult to convince the Generalitat of Catalonia, but thanks to the help of Xavier, the spaces of the Battle of the Algas have already been inscribed in the map of graves of the, civil, of the Spanish Civil War. Now, we are a space of the democratic memorial of the, Generali of the Generalitat de Catalonia, with the help of the archeologists and forensics experts of the Generalitat, we recovered the remains of four soldiers, probably Republicans. The bones of three of them were in poor condition, so we couldn't do the DNA test. These bones rest in the memorial of the Ebros battle in Camposinas, so the relative of international volunteers who died in the Algais River can pay homage there. The remains of a soldier, of one of these soldiers, was in a better state of preservation, and we are waiting for the results of DNA test. Among other important tasks to uh, raise awareness in Spanish society, to know what happened on the Algas River and who international volunteers such as Finnegan were. For this reason, we have published uh, this book. Uh, that today I don't speak much about it because our intention is to, to publish this book in English to all of us who could read the book. Our work uh, doesn't end here. I always say that it's only the beginning. And I am pleased to announce it that the Generalitat de Catalunya has allocated part of its budget to excavate the common graves of the Algas River. In the current year, 2019, we'll start digging. Our intention is that John Finnegan return to this wonderful land that is Ireland. This beautiful land that today opened his heart so that we remember his son John, who rests in the Catalan land. For him and all the international volunteers, I said goodbye, saying, Viva las Brigadas Internacionales. We want to give one exemplar of our book in, in Catalan to the Phoebe Association so everybody could 
look this this book. At this juncture, could we also maybe make the presentation of the plaque, Bernie? And we would ask that the, the Catalan delegation who have don't, done so much valuable work in researching uh, a long lost son of Corduff. Um, if we could make a presentation of a plaque, please, from the Catalans to the local community. Okay, that's certainly a photograph for posterity. This is some of the living relatives of John Finnegan. Um, I don't know how much of the story you knew, chaps, uh, but I, I found out a lot today. I didn't realize it was so tantalizingly close, the prospect of actually bringing home the remains of John Finnegan, and I wish the Catalan authorities and the authorities in Batea every success in their efforts with that. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the relatives of the Brigaders are the backbone of Phoebe, it has to be said, and we have other relatives in the room here with us. Uh, Manus O'Reardon, um, son of Mick O'Reardon, is here in front of us, who takes his, the flag uh, everywhere around the world. Um, who else is Anna Monks is also here, uh, daughter of Joe Monks. Any other relatives here? Uh, but those people have supported Phoebe for years and years, and they attend all our functions. And we would like to see some of the Finnegan and Riley clan, maybe on some of our future trips out to the Ebro, so you can see where John um, actually ended his days. You'd be more than welcome. Thanks to everybody for attending today, and to Bernie and to Eddie for their Trojan work, really. This man was unknown to us. I mean, obviously, he'd, we never knew what happened to him, or nobody knew what happened to him, and it's... It was a complete revelation that he'd gone and died in the Spanish Civil War. In fact, his family was very much politically aligned the other way, which is really <laughs> surprised us. But it's, it's really, it's really, um, it's been amazing to know that and to find it out. And for the work that's been done by Itar as well, he's, he's done some amazing research. And good luck with your PhD, sir. <laughs> and to Javier as well, too, from the Spanish government who's come here and contributed to as well, to us and told us a little bit, of, told us a lot actually about the history of it. So we wish you well, sir, and in your political life as well too. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us. Finally, all I'm going to say, my final words of this morning or this afternoon are, um, but while I'm buihas more a goal leshna kyolthari in shaw, um, big round of applause for the fantastic musicians. That worked an actual dream. I mean, that, that was not planned, but I, I think you'll, you'll all agree the music made the film incredibly emotional. Very much, and Gurumai Gadesh, and...